Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Right, I'm struggling to see how, how many people are joining us here. So my, my fellow panellists, could you let me know when I should kick off? <laughs> yeah, we've got 56 in at the moment, so. Perfect, thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Right, I can see, I'm, I can see it now. I think that's pretty much finished, has it? Is everybody here, do we think? We've got 57, 58 in. Let's kick off then. That's great. Welcome. This Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us um, for the final instalment of our uh, Nature Trek Roadshow evenings. We've really enjoyed being able to visit you all uh, over the winter and you giving us the opportunity to, um, to share all the wonderful wildlife experiences um, that we're able to offer. We hope we've given you plenty of inspiration and kept you, um, kept you busy and entertained during some cold and dark evenings. Um, so yeah, thank you to those of you who've tuned in over several of these evenings. We do know there are lots of familiar names who are popping up now. Um, so we're, we're always delighted to have you here with us. So hopefully this evening we'll be going out with a bang um, and this evening we'll be doing something a little bit different and talking about our tailor-made wildlife holidays. So as well as our group holidays, we do offer a full portfolio of tailor-made holidays uh, as well. And that's primarily what, what I do. I've worked for Nature Trek for the last nine years now. And my name is Georgie Head and I'm our tailor-made manager. Uh, and so I'll be giving you a bit of an introduction to TaylorMade this evening, and then I'll be speaking to you about uh, the mountain gorillas of Uganda and Rwanda, um, which I've been very lucky to visit on a, a couple of occasions now. Um, so alongside me, we've got my colleague, George Vincent, who also works in our TaylorMade department. Um, and George is a primate, primate mad. Um, so he will be speaking to you about the other primates of the world uh, for the second part of this evening. We'll then have another about 15 minute break so you can catch a cup of tea or a glass of wine uh, and catch your breath before Paul whisks you away to Costa Rica. Um, so Paul's worked in our in our team for God knows how long now, Paul, more years and I'm sure he could care to remember. <laughs> many, um, many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul Paul is um, yeah very keen on Costa Rica and has visited many times. So um, hopefully he'll be giving you some good inspiration for the tailor-made opportunities there. And last but not least, we've got Rajan Jolly, uh, who will be speaking to you about all things India and Sri Lanka to, to close off the evening. So welcome, Rajan. Thank you. And then for the final part of the evening, we'll have a Q&A session. So throughout the evening, please do pop in your questions uh, and use the chat function as much as you'd like. We really love to hear from you and have that sort of interaction with you throughout the evening. But then at the final part of the evening, we'll more formally answer a few of those questions as well. So do keep them coming through. Uh, so without further ado, I will just start off with a bit of an introduction to tailor-made. Um, so first of all, what is a tailor-made holiday? Now, a lot of people don't really even know what that word actually means. And really, it's just a completely bespoke wildlife holiday, which is designed um, completely around you, your specific interests and experiences. So um, it might be that you have a particular bird that you've always wanted to see and you really want to focus all of your efforts throughout the holiday on that particular species and we can create a very tailored specific package for you. It might be on the other end of the extreme that this is your first wildlife holiday or your first visit to Africa or, or anywhere else and you would like us to create something all-encompassing to give you the very best of, of uh, wildlife, history, culture, everything else. Um, so we will listen to you, we will take in your specific needs and we will craft a, a tailored holiday perfectly for you. Uh, so where can you go to on a tailor-made holiday? I will apologise for the busyness of this slide. When I was previously doing this, it was nicely faded out so you could read all those words properly, but I appreciate it's a little bit tricky now. Um, but really, this is just a demonstration of a, the broad range of holidays um, and destinations that we can organise tailor-made holidays to. Working for, um, as a company for 37 years, we've had the opportunity to establish some great relationships with some of the world's very best naturalist guides. And those are the people who, be, who will be leading you throughout your Nature Trek holiday. So you'll really 
giving to the local economy and supporting local people on the ground um, throughout your tailor-made holiday. So who can travel on a tailor-made holiday? We get a lot of people who um, think that uh, perhaps to join a tailor-made tour, you have to have a large group of people to travel with. But actually, we can organise things on a completely individual basis. If it's just one of you, we, we can do that as well. We organise a lot for just couples um, and as well as groups of friends and um, families as well. There's no minimum age for a tailor-made holiday. So although on our group holidays, often we do find that they're not particularly suited to some children um, just because they, they require a lot of patience and it's, it doesn't necessarily work with the other members of group. But with a tailor-made holiday, um, we can organise activities that are exciting for children. As well as the wildlife safaris, they might go out and join a, a Maasai um, hunter, uh, not hunter, sorry, definitely not hunter, but a Maasai warrior building spears and, and doing other sort of traditional exciting activities. Um, and so we can do lots for children. Um, but we can also organise some sort of slower paced holidays, um, should, you, should you wish that as well. So they really are for anybody. Um, a common misconception is that tailor-made holidays are particularly expensive. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Um, we have the luxury that we can use lodges, which are either very luxurious, should you wish them to be, or more basic, if you would prefer that, that kind of thing. Um, Sometimes they can be more expensive if we have a private guide for you throughout, as obviously the sort of fixed costs of that guiding aren't necessarily split between a group. But in some countries, even that's not that much more expensive. Um, so they really can be quite reasonable. And if you're interested in a tailor-made holiday, I would encourage you to speak to our experts, discuss your budget, and, and then we can work around you. So to learn more about our tailor-made holidays, hopefully we'll give you plenty of inspiration in this evening's presentations. Um, but we also have a dedicated tailor-made brochure, which is an ideas brochure that, that should get you started. Um, but I'd also encourage you to look at our tailor-made website. It's a separate section of our Nature Track website, and it's full of sample itineraries. It's got lots of information about the lodges that we use, the locations that we visit. Uh, so you can take a look at that for a bit of inspiration. But most of all, I would say, pick up the phone or drop us an email and we'd be more than happy to discuss your specific requirements and start putting together a tailored itinerary for you. So that's enough about tailor-made. On to the main aspect of this evening that you're probably more here to hear about is the wonderful wildlife and holidays that we that we organise. Um, so as I said, I've been very lucky that I've been able to experience the mountain gorillas of both Uganda and Rwanda. And one of the most common questions that we frequently get answered get asked sorry is uh, which which is the best one which is going to make, give me the very best experience um, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a few of the pros and cons uh, and a, a bit more of an insight into what a gorilla experience looks like this evening. So first of all I'll just mention a bit about this really incredible species. So back in the 1980s uh, they were they numbers were incredibly decimated. There were only about 400 individuals left in the wild, um, largely due to habitat fragmentation. There was also a lot of poaching at that time, um, largely for sort of trophy hunting and for sort of captive populations, uh, which sadly, unfortunately, died just because they, they can't tend to live in those conditions. Um, there was there was occasionally um, although it wasn't actually for meat, the poaching um, for, for other wildlife, they would get caught in snares and things like that. So they really did struggle, um, as well as through political conflict, um, particularly the, the genocide in Rwanda in the early 90s uh, and the ongoing conflict in the DRC. They really do face a tough time due to their geographical position. Um, but this is really where conservation and, and guerrilla tourism has come into it really starting with the work of Diane Fossey um, early in, in the 1960s and uh, later on. And then by the 90s, um, guerrilla tourism really came into its own when the Ugandan Wildlife Authority started issuing guerrilla permits. And so that would allow um, tourists to go in and spend some time with the gorillas uh, who had been habituated, which meant they were still able to exhibit their completely natural behaviours um, and without being worried about the rest of a group. So as you can see here, they really they, they don't worry about the humans at all. This is a gorilla on one of my recent experiences, uh, and he looks very relaxed, um, which is generally what you'll find throughout most of the time. 
So um, you will find that the silverbacks are generally very, um, they're very relaxed, they're not too bothered at all, but the babies are incredibly inquisitive um, and they're, it really is just like human interactions. Gorillas actually, mountain gorillas actually share 98% of their DNA with humans. Um, and you can really see that in the way that they communicate with each other, um, in their feeding behaviour and everything else. So to give you a bit of background between Uganda and Rwanda and the different populations, um, they are a species that is completely restricted to an Afro-Montane habitat. And as you can see, and it's a very small, small area that they're confined to. They do have two completely separated uh, geographic populations. Um, so the first is in Windy Impenetrable National Park in Uganda, uh, which you can see is that top red circle there. And the bottom is in the Virunga Mountains. Um, so that population borders Rwanda, Uganda and the DRC. Obviously, we can't currently travel to the DRC for political uh, reasons. It's just not safe to do so. Um, but generally, all the guerrilla tourism around there is, um, is very safe. We've never had any issues sort of being close to the DRC or anything like that. Um, so as I say, it's, it's DRC, Uganda and Rwanda. Um, but actually in Uganda, that population there, they do frequently come over to Rwanda. So we don't recommend that people visit that Mugahinga area of, of gorillas um, as occasionally if they move into the Rwandan sector, then you, your gorilla permit is only valid for one country. Um, so you would you would miss the chance to see them. So really, we would recommend that you either visit them in Windy in Uganda or in the Volcanoes National Park, which is part of the Virunga population in Rwanda. So then people ask us, what, what is a gorilla trek? What's, what's my day like? How does, it, how does it go? So in both Uganda and Rwanda, you will start at the gorilla headquarters. This is the Rwandan gorilla headquarters, um, which is much more imposing, um, much more impressive than the Ugandan headquarters, um, which are much more rustic, much more basic. You kind of pitch up on a log um, and, and somebody will come and talk to you about things. Um, whereas here they've got a, an excellent education centre as part of it as well. But, but in essence, it's really the same thing that happens in both. In both areas, you will um, be allocated to gorilla family. So that will be one of the 44 habituated groups of gorillas in either Bwindi or Volcanoes National Park. And there'll be up to eight people in your group. Um, and then the gorilla trackers will have gone out much earlier in the morning and they will go to the area where that particular family was seen the day before. Um, so they will then spend some time looking for them and they will then radio through to your guide uh, as soon as they find them. Hopefully it's not too much further um, and uh, you'll continue your trek from there. So the trek itself, you really got to be prepared for a very arduous trek. Um, so sometimes they can be found within an hour if you're very lucky, uh, but sometimes it can take up to six hours to reach them. So um, you can't... Uh, you can't ask for it to visit a particular group and you can't ask for an easy trek. Um, usually they'll sort of uh, slightly do it by who they think is the most able of the, the participants they have that day. Um, but that's only based on where the gorillas were the day before. And if you then find that they were um, that they then moved on several miles since they were the day before, you end up with a very tough trek. So whatever happens, just be prepared for a tough trek. So um, there are ways that you can make it easier. One way is to hire a gorilla porter um, like this chap that we've got here. So they will carry all of your bags, um, all of your water. Um, so they, they do make it much easier. They will point out every little anthill. They will move every twig from you and they will just drag you up the mountain if you really need to. So they are absolutely invaluable. And we would highly recommend that you hire a, a gorilla porter wherever it is that you're, you're traveling. Um, so also they importantly um, contribute to the local economy. So these are local people who otherwise would be using the forest for, for other means. Um, so it's important that we make it worthwhile um, for them to, to use the forest and protect the species in this way. So this is probably a site that you would only see in Rwanda rather than Uganda. As just outside the Volcanoes National Park, uh, there are lots of sort of um, terraced farmland um, that, that really goes right up to the edge of the Volcanoes National Park, whereas in Bwindi, it's more of a sort of gradual um, exit out of the park. So 
Some people say that it's a, an easier trek because of this, um, but actually, generally, the, the gorillas are much further into the park anyway. So although your trek might start off a bit easier, it, it then potentially is, gets quite tough as well. So I personally don't really think there's a huge difference in difficulty level between Rwanda and Uganda. Because at some point you will eventually end up in something like this. Um, in Bwindi, it's called the impenetrable forest for a reason. And in Rwanda, it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, so, yeah, it, it's quite challenging terrain that, that you've really got to be um, prepared for. But this is what it's all about. This is what we finally get to is this incredible encounter uh, with the gorilla family. As you can see here, the babies are interacting and we've got the silverback sort of further away there. Um, and then... We've got a nice group here that, as you can see, is keeping the really good distance of at least seven metres away. So this is the, the absolute minimum distance that we must be to the gorillas at all time. Um, as I mentioned, they have 98% shared DNA with humans, and that means that they can pick up a lot of our diseases as well. Um, and something like the common cold that might be very innocuous to us could be absolutely fatal to the gorillas. So it's absolutely vital that we do keep our distance to protect them in that way. Um, you will find that the babies can come up to you and really got to do your best to try and, um, and back off and keep away from them. Um, but we really do need to protect the, these really endangered species. And then we can get some great photos and perhaps even selfies, um, as I've got here. So again, we just need to be really careful at all times as the gorillas do tend to be moving around. But um, but yeah, it's it's fantastic fun. And this is this is actually a group who are birding. They're not necessarily actually looking for the gorillas at this point. But I just included this slide as it gives a, a good example of what kind of uh, clothing we should be wearing during a gorilla trekking. It can actually be um, quite high. It's, it's a very high altitude that we'll be traveling. So it can get quite chilly, particularly as we set off early in the morning. So you definitely want to make sure you're very covered up. As I say, there can also be some biting insects. So you'll see this chap here has sensibly tucked his uh, trousers into his socks there. Um, and yeah, so it's important to take layers, basically. And as I said, the porters will be um, there to carry all your belongings. So it's not a problem to take layers. And yes, this is this is what we're all here for. Um, so this is the, the mighty mountain gorillas and we'll get photo photographs, hopefully. A lot of people ask um, whether we would take one or two gorilla treks. Um, generally a standard, well, on our group tours anyway, we only offer one trek. And most people on tailor-made holidays will also decide to do one trek. It's just one of those absolutely incredible once in a lifetime experiences um, that uh, I don't personally think that you need to do it again. If you're a photographer, perhaps it might be worth it as you never know exactly where the gorillas are going to be. If you're unlucky and they're sort of all, um, yeah, not, not in such a nice clearing, then you might get better photographs on a second trek. Um, but I certainly don't think it's necessary for, for the majority of people. Um, and so one thing that I haven't mentioned um, that's perhaps the most important factor on deciding between Uganda and Rwanda for most people is the difference in the price of the gorilla permits. So in Uganda, those are currently priced at $700 per person, and that's for the one hour exactly that you get to spend with the gorillas. And they are very tight on that as for the other 23 hours a day. Um, they, they are free to roam and they're, they're not disturbed by people at all. But then in Rwanda, that price goes up to $1,500 per person. Now, that uh, all goes into cons guerrilla conservation, so it's all for a great cause, um, but it, it does make it prohibitively expensive for, for a lot of people and is certainly an influencing factor anyway. So another influencing factor that might determine whether you decide to visit Uganda or Rwanda would be the amount of other wildlife that you get to see and the kind of other holiday that, that you're looking for, really. Um, so I'll just go through a few of the other national parks and a few of the other areas of interest uh, in starting in Uganda at the Chibali National Park, um, where we can see the chimpanzees. So the chimpanzee permits are just $150, so it is much more accessible um, than the uh, Uganda permits. Um, it's a very different experience. So the, the chimpanzees will be moving around much more. It's much more active. Um, they're much louder. It's There are groups of between sort of 30 and 100. Um, so it is, can be a little bit more frantic than, than the gorillas, which tends to be quite a nice serene experience where once you're there, you tend to just sort of stay in one place and let them do their thing. 
Um, so Jabali is also great uh, for primates. Um, George will speak to you a lot more about primates in his next presentation, but Jabali in particular is an excellent location with up to 11 species of primates, um, such as these colobus monkeys. Um, with, they've got uh, great cheek mangabe, lahos monkeys. So it, it really is a fantastic destination for primates. Birders amongst you might like to visit the Mabamba Swamp to see the fantastic shoebill stork. Um, not a stork by any means at all, but um, fantastic species nonetheless, um, with these really impressive bills and standing at huge heights. So they, they really are fantastic. Um, and a lot of people like to visit those on the way down to go to the gorillas. We'll go and see them in these dugout canoes. Um, so that's another thing about Uganda. There's a, a wide variety of different activities that you can do through obviously the trekking in Windy. Um, and then you've got the water based activities and then you've got some vehicle safaris as well. And we can take vehicle safaris in Lake Maburo National Park. Um, we can also take boating safaris and see species such as the Sitatunga antelope. Um, we've got lovely birds there as well. We've got African scops owl pennant wing nightjar um, and African finfoot. Again, we can take a boat trip out to see the African finfoot. And then for the more mammal enthusiasts amongst you, um, visit Queen Elizabeth National Park really can't be beaten, um, perhaps after going to see the gorillas. Um, so the tree climbing lions are a really key um, species so phenomenon to see here. Um, it's very unusual behavior that we can see in the Ashasha region of the park. Got Uganda cob. Um, they're not completely endemic to Uganda, but they can be seen in, in nice big numbers in um, Queen Elizabeth, as well as leopard um, and, and lots of other iconic species. And also in Queen Elizabeth, we have the opportunity to go along the Kazinga Channel, um, which is fantastic. So we'll take particularly for birders. Um, this is a fantastic experience um, as we take out these boats and the, the variety of water birds to be seen here is, is truly magnificent as well as other species such as elephants and buffalo and um, yeah, other common safari species. Murchison National Falls National Park is actually my favourite national park in Uganda. Um, it's quite far to the north, so not all holidays will get there. It really depends on the time that you have available. Um, but I think it's a scenically stunning national park um, full of magnificent wildlife uh, and also spe spectacles such as this, as this sort of now falls in. Um, and you can walk to the top of the falls as well. So for walkers, it's a great experience. It's the only place you can see Rothschild giraffe in Uganda. And so that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour of the, the wildlife of Uganda. Um, but Rwanda also has its own wildlife as well, obviously starting in the Volcanoes National Park, which is where you'll see the gorillas. Um, we then, so Volcanoes National Park, again, has lots of species of primates. Uh, we've got golden monkeys, lahos monkeys. Um, we've got special birds there as well, like the Bruinsori Churico, uh, this regal sunbird. So lots of lovely birding there. The only Savannah National Park in uh, Rwanda is Akagera National Park. Um, now that was actually really suffered after the, the genocide in the 90s. Um, it used to be sort of double, even triple the size. Um, but unfortunately, they lost a lot of that land as the people became displaced. Um, there was a lot of deforestation and a lot of poaching of the native wildlife. Um, so they, they did lose a lot of their native species. But nowadays, it's a fantastic area to visit as it's going through an amazing reintroduction program. So they've re recently reintroduced uh, leopards and rhinos as well. So you definitely won't see them in the, the big numbers that you might see in Uganda. But you can go out with the sort of anti-poaching teams as well and learn exactly about the conservation work that's being done there. So for people who might, might have gone on quite a few safaris, it does offer a, a slightly different element as well. And finally, going down to the, the south to Nyungwe Forest National Park, um, which is where you'll go to the chimpanzees, uh, as you would in Chibali sector of Uganda. So again, it's quite a similar experience. I personally think the trekking in Nyungwe is slightly more difficult um, and the, the chimpanzees can be more difficult to find. They are habituated, but probably not quite to the same extent as they are in Uganda. Um, so, but again, it's an incredible experience and, and get to see them exhibiting all these wonderful behaviours. Another thing to mention when deciding between Uganda and Rwanda is the type of accommodation available. 
So at the moment, uh, Rwanda does kind of struggle to offer sort of mid-range accommodation. And you've either got either this really, really high-end, beautiful accommodation, such as Bizarti Lodge that we've got here, um, or it really can be quite basic indeed. So if you've got sort of a, a mid-level budget, if you're looking for something sort of comfortable but not too luxurious, it can actually be quite difficult to find something at that level. Um, so Rwanda's got a little bit of a way to go there. Whereas in Uganda, it's got a very well-established tourism industry that's been going for a long, long time, and it's able to offer lodges at sort of any level, really. Uh, so this is Mahogany Springs Lodge that we use in uh, the Bwindi Impenetrable Forest, um, which is a lovely lodge in a fantastic location, um, as we would always sort of choose for an H-Trek holiday. Um, but again, there, there is more basic accommodation, should you wish, or there is, is more luxury accommodation. So I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight into the differences between uh, Uganda and Rwanda. In all honesty, I would probably say if you had to pick one from a completely wildlife perspective, I think Uganda probably has a little bit more to offer. Um, it's got all sort of different national parks. Um, it's a fantastic birding. Rwanda obviously has a fantastic heritage and history. Um, it's so interesting. Um, it's a beautiful country as well. And it's much smaller than Rwanda, than Uganda, sorry. So slightly easier to get around. Um, but um, but but yeah, it's really up to you. you. You can also cross the border quite easily between Uganda and Rwanda. So you could even go for a combined holiday if you wish. So that is a very whistle-stop tour of Uganda or Rwanda. Um, I say, if you've got any questions at all, please do pop them through in the Q&A and I'll answer as many as I can. Um, but for now, I will hand over to George, who will speak about primates. Thank you very much, Georgie. I'll just uh, share my screen here. And then hopefully I'm going to turn on my computer audio as well so you'll be able to hear. So um, for, you, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's George, and I work in TaylorMade department with Georgie, and I've uh, got a particular interest in mammals. I've always been absolutely fascinated by primates, um, mostly because of their sort of human-like tendencies, um, their agility and energy makes them an absolute joy to watch in the field. Um, and I've actually been lucky enough to record nearly 90 species now uh, across my lifetime. Um, so primates are found in all sorts of habitats, but primarily forests. And um, as you'll see from this map here, They've got a um, tropical distribution, really. So they're found across South America, Central and South America, Africa and Asia. Um, and I'm going to try and pick a example um, destination from each continent. But really, from a tailor-made perspective, there, there is just too much to include uh, in, in, in such a short talk. So, yeah, your options are, are pretty much limitless. So primates themselves are distinguished from other mammals uh, by having a larger brain. Um, an omnivorous dentition, so they don't really have that much specialization in their teeth, so they, um, they're, they're very adaptable, and they also have four limbs ending in hands and flat nails, much like us. So they can be broadly split into, uh, split into three groups, so the lemuriform primates, which is the lemurs and the lorises, which are considered sort of the most primitive primates, uh, and then also the tarsiers, and then finally the higher primates, of which we're a part of. Um, and so sort of technology um, and um, research has rapidly increased over the last few uh, decades, um, which has also led to some serious changes in taxonomy. So around 1980, there are about 200 species of primate recognized. Um, but today, the IUCN recognizes upwards of 600 species, um, with around 36 new species either discovered or split since uh, in the last 10 years alone. So it's, it's a really exciting time to be, to be watching primates. So we'll start off in Africa. Um, of course, Africa is a spectacularly beautiful continent, um, but it offers so much more than safaris, which have perhaps typified wildlife holidays in Africa. Um, of course, Georgie's gone on about uh, Uganda, um, and she did mention um, uh, a couple of the other parks in Uganda. And um, yeah, there's like 25 species of, of, of primate in Uganda. So, you know, if that was something you're interested in, that, that there's a lot of potential there too. But I, I, I want to focus on Madagascar today, which is probably the holy grail uh, for primate watchers. Um, where, uh, some, for those of you that, that know, um, it's on the east coast of Africa. It's the fourth biggest island in the world. So it's sort of similar in size to Spain and Portugal combined. And it's split from the African mainland around 165 million years ago. So it's had all that time to, um, for, for the wildlife on it to evolve. And as a result, it's a, it's a real hotbed of biodiversity. And around 80% of the species uh, on the island are endemic. And of course, 100% of the primates are endemic. They're all lemurs. 
Um, they're, they're, they're the only primates on the island, and there are around 100 species of, of distinct species of lemur. Um, and quite sadly, uh, around 90% of those species are, are now threatened with extinction. So it is really uh, a, a fantastic time to get to Madagascar while, while, they're still, while they're still there. And tourism is so important to keep them protected as well. Um, a, a lot of the um, biodiversity is thanks to this varied habitat that, that Madagascar has. And as you'll see here, there's a, a sort of a eastern band of, of coastal rainforest runs from north to south. And then also you've got the arid, uh, spiny, dry forest in, 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 the, in the south of the country, which is very unique, a unique habitat. So I'm just going to highlight a few of the um, spots you might you might want to select from the, from the East Coast Rainforest, for instance, um, and the CB Mantadia National Park. Um, this is a fantastic location, particularly famous for the injury, uh, which is a very enigmatic lemur. It's the largest of the lemur species. Um, as you'll see here, it's got a very, very short tail and it's unique in its behavior in that it, it leaps between uh, between trees, but it remains vertical. Um, and it has a absolutely fantastic call. It's quite bizarre, um, which could be heard for over two kilometers away. And I just want to play you a short clip of it now. I hope it's not too loud. So perhaps you might want to turn down your volume a little bit. Let, 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 here we go. It's a very bizarre sound, and then they, they make that sound um, most mostly in the mornings. And it's just a form of communication, um, and the the locals actually consider them um, to be songs of the ancestors. It's, it's quite poetic, really. Um, and in the same location, we've also got diadem safarca and black and white rough lemur, both of which are, are like many of Madagascar's lemurs, sadly critically endangered, but um, quite well seen in this location. And then a little bit further to the south, we've got Ranamfana National Park, uh, which is, again is a, a very typical rainforest ecosystem. And one of our key targets here is the Milne Edwards Safarka. Uh, but also you've got other species in, in the area like red-bellied lemur and red-fronted brown lemur. Uh, but it's also particularly good for the bamboo lemurs, uh, of which there are three species here, um, all of which have highly restricted ranges. Uh, the aptly named Ranama Farmer bamboo lemur is actually the most common of the three. Uh, again, only lives here, um, hence the name. And then also the highly sought after golden bamboo lemur, which has that sort of uh, key characteristics of a target primate being both very attractive and very rare. And these bamboo lemurs have got a really unique ability to de detoxify cyanide. Um, the bamboo they eat is actually poisonous and that's all they eat. And science isn't still quite sure how they do it. Um, but yeah, it's, they're super, super specialized just to eat this bamboo. Then the third of the three species is the perhaps the, the most endangered of them all, the greater bamboo lemur. And this was only rediscovered in the, the late 20th century, um, having previously thought to have gone extinct. Um, and back in 2010, when I visited and this photo was taken, this was probably the most endangered primate in the world, uh, with only two or three pairs in the park. Um, now it's really made a really strong comeback, and with some really good guiding, some of the guiding in Madagascar is, is, is up there with the best in the world. Um, you, you, there's de definitely a decent chance to, to, that you've got a shot to see them for sure. Another key target for many in the, in the rainforest band is the um, II. But absolutely bizarre primate, uh, probably the stranger to them all. Uh, it's got that strange uh, probe-like middle finger, which it taps on the wood uh, to locate grubs and then uses the, uses the same finger to hook them out again. Uh, it's really quite strange. And then this is particularly relevant for tailor-made clients. Um, the north and the northwest of the island um, are quite notoriously quite difficult to access for groups. So we, we, we tend to avoid sending groups there. Uh, but the, for tailor-made clients looking to see the rarest of the lemur species, uh, this is the place to go. So this is actually taken by one of our tailor-made clients just before Christmas. Uh, this absolutely gorgeous uh, blue-eyed black lemur pairing. Uh, they're sexually uh, dimorphic. So the males are jet black and the females are this gorgeous orange color with blue eyes. And also up in the same region, you've got Perius safarca and crown lemur, again, two, two highly restricted and endangered species. And then down to the south of the country, you've got the unique spiny forest habitat, um, which Madagascar is quite famous for. And this is one of the locations where we find um, King Julian, uh, which of course the ring-tailed lemur uh, made famous by the movie franchise Madagascar. And perhaps this typifies lemur for many people, um, but they can be seen in really, really quite large numbers down in the south of the country. And yeah, they're, they're very charismatic. Um, and, and another charismatic lemur in the similar area is the Veru Safarka. Um, these guys are, are quite famous for, for dancing uh, between trees. They actually hop vertically across the ground covering quite large distances between trees. And it's, it's, it's a very unique behavior um, that can be seen in the south of the country. 
But so far, I've only really mentioned the diurnal um, primates in, in Madagascar, but two thirds of lemurs are actually nocturnal, um, such as the eye, I, I suppose I have mentioned the eye, but other than that, two thirds of lemurs are actually nocturnal. Um, and a certain location in, in the south called Corindi National Park is absolutely fantastic for these uh, nocturnal lemurs, particularly because it's basically just too hot for them to, to uh, operate in the day. So, so many of them have adapted to forage and hunt at nighttime when it's a lot cooler. Um, such as uh, cockerel's giant mouse lemur and the much more common grey mouse lemur. It's also um, one of the best locations uh, to find not only the smallest lemur in the world, but in fact the smallest primate in the world, as Madame Berth's mouse lemur. Uh, it averages in at just under 10 centimetres in length and weighs only around 30 grams. So it really is absolutely tiny and very, very cute. And there's plenty of other um, primates here as well, uh, too many to mention really. Uh, so you can be on the lookout for fat-tailed dwarf lemurs and then, and then a variety of fort-marked and sportive lemurs as well. So I hope that gives you some overview of Madagascar. As I say, it's it's absolutely a huge country and there's so much to target. Um, but just briefly moving on to the Americas. Uh, again, so many options here. Uh, Brazil and Peru are certainly notable mentions. Of course, you've got the Atlantic rainforest in, in, in Brazil and of, uh, the Amazon basin, of course. But I've decided to uh, talk about Colombia which um, I think is an absolutely brilliant country. It holds 10% of the world's biodiversity, which for its size is an incredibly impressive figure. Um, and it's always been very popular with birders, um, but at the same time overlooked sort of from a mammal on a mammal front, uh, which seems to me a bit of a shame because uh, there's, there's around 40 species of primate alone that are recorded in Colombia. And you know a figure that high for any country outside of Madagascar is very, very impressive. Um, and it's partly down to the unique geography once again, um, it means you've got a lot of a uh, lot of end a uh, lot of endemism and also a lot of regional species crossing over to other countries as well. So you've got the Amazon basin and the um, a couple of strains of the Andes mountains, and then of course we've we've also got this unique um, what they call the Orinoco area, which is sort of, sort of Pantanal type um, transitional area between forest and uh, wetland. And I've decided to uh, break Colombia down into a little bit more of an example tour, what you might want to put together if you're looking for primates. So we might start, um, this is south of Bogota in the, in the Janos, or the transitional region. And this is great for, for these two particular endemics, the ornate titi, which is only re very recently described, and uh, Brumpback's night monkey. And so night monkeys are actually the only true nocturnal higher primate. And um, the guides we have actually keep tabs on where they roost. So they, they hunt at night or forage at night and then come back um, and, and sort of sit in their roosts and have a little look out during the day. So that's the best time to see them. Um, and they are really quite bizarre, bizarre to be seen, seen in the daytime. Um, we've also got um, this guy running around in a similar area, the Colombian squirrel monkey. It's actually not endemic, but it, uh, it's sort of a, a, a regional endemic subspecies of, of the common squirrel monkey. And then we could fly on um, up, up north to the Magdalena Valley, which is a sort of forested area sandwiched between two strains of the Andes Mountains. And again, this is a, a real hotbed of endemism, uh, thanks to sort of years and years of isolation. So we've got some sought after species here. Um, the varied white fronted capuchin, which is probably my favorite of the capuchin monkeys, just purely from the, the real contrast between the, the bright white head and then the sort of chocolatey um, brown body. And then also the silvery brown bare-faced tamarind. Um, tamarinds, for, for those of you that have seen tamarinds in the wild, are some of the most exciting monkeys to watch because they are so, so active and they just never sit still. Uh, there's one particular, sorry, I didn't mean to skip on that. There's one particular reserve here called El Pal Hill, um, which is actually set up for the conservation of the blue-billed curacao, uh, this, this bird here, which is now a very, very rare species throughout the rest of Colombia, uh, but it's doing very well in this reserve. Um, but for mammal watchers, the reason for visiting the same area is that the protection of the forest uh, is now is now a stronghold for one of the most endangered primates in South America, the brown or variegated spider monkey. Um, again, with the local guiding here, we've got a really good chance to see them. Uh, this is actually my photo from September last year uh, when I visited for the first time. And there's a uh, basically there's a there's a canopy tower. You can go up the canopy tower, and then what we do is we have a scan of the forest um, around four or five o'clock, just when the uh, monkeys are going to roost. And then we can try and target that area of forest in the morning. And that really gives us a really good chance to see them. And then maybe the final region uh, you might want to go to is the Santa Marta coastal forest on the north coast. Uh, once again, we've got another end, another endemic capuchin, the Santa Marta white fronted capuchin, which is visibly quite different. You can see that the white uh, on the head 
uh, stretches down to the shoulders this time, comes across the shoulders. Um, and also another charismatic tamarind, probably my favorite primate to, to observe in the wild, the cotton top tamarind. Um, yeah, these guys are fantastic and, and probably the main reason that you, you consider visiting Santa Marta from a primate perspective. Um, I believe uh, our local zoo, Marwell, uh, has, ha has always had some. So um, these guys, yeah, they're fantastic. And these two, uh, these two species, the grey-handed night monkey and the Colombian red howler, uh, particularly the latter, uh, they're very well widespread throughout Colombia, um, or certainly throughout the last two regions I've just mentioned. Um, so yeah, they're really likely. And um, yeah, I, everyone loves the howler monkey. Um, I, I think the red howlers are, are, are probably one of the most attractive of the howler species as well. And then, and then finally, I just want to talk about um, some spots in Asia. So Asia is sort of the home of the super rare, uh, and of course the home of the gibbon as well. And once again, there's there's a there's a whole bunch of locations I'd like to talk about. Um, I think the peninsula of Malaysia often gets overlooked in favour of Borneo. Um, however, it, it offers really some of the easiest, most accessible primate watching in the world. And then of course. Um, it, we've got some locations in Indonesia like Sulawesi, uh, where we can um, get some really good views of the um, critically endangered Celebes crested macaque as well. But I'm, I'm going to choose to focus on Vietnam. Uh, some of you might have seen my group tour uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, sorry, the talk about the group tour a few weeks ago. Uh, but for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Vietnam is a country in Southeast Asia, uh, bordering China to the north, Laos and Cambodia to the west, um, with this central Annamite range uh, running down the middle of the country. And it's recorded around 23 different dis uh, distinct species here, and nearly all of which are endangered. Um, so Vietnam really is, excuse me, Vietnam really is the home of the endangered primate. Um, and primate watching in this part of the world is really quite a different experience. Uh, it requires a lot of patience and some, some excellent guiding, but uh, the rewards, the payoff is actually huge because you end up seeing species that not many people see in their lifetime. Um, so of those 23 species, there are eight true langa species in Vietnam, um, all of which are, are endangered and, and most of which are very elusive. Uh, but the first up I'm going to talk about is Delacour's langa, and it's probably actually the most endangered of them all, uh, or certainly one of the most endangered, and there's only less, there's less than 250 mature individuals uh, left in the wild. However, uh, their restricted range um, does make them quite reliably seen because uh, we go to a certain area where, where they are seen quite with some uh, regularity. Um, generally speaking, some of the, some of the more uh, endangered primates further north than this, this is in the north of the country, uh, like uh, Tonkin snub-nosed monkey, um, unfortunately you need a permit to access that forest now. So th this is sort of the last of the um, super endangered um, species that, that, that you can see with uh, some, some regularity. Another one of the Langa species, this one's a little trickier to see, uh, but certainly possible uh, in the central Annamite range. And as you might notice, um, many Langa species are actually born orange, and then as they grow up, they turn black. Um, scientists aren't really sure why they do it, but they think it's sort of a, to elicit a, a caregiving response from the mother. And also another theory is that, that it just makes them harder to lose in the undergrowth, which I suppose is a, is a sensible suggestion. Another um, of the langur species that we've got a, probably the best chance for is the um, Annamese silver langur, um, which can be seen in the south uh, with some good luck. This photo was actually taken uh, by our guide in Vietnam, Richard. Um, so yeah, the, 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 these are really cool and um, they are constrained just to the Annamite range. So just in the, they just sort of, um, they just cross over the border into Cambodia as well and, and a little bit in Laos, uh, but mostly it's they're only in this sort of south central Vietnam area. And then we come to the three Duke species, uh, which are perhaps the most well-known or certainly most uh, famous of the, of the Vietnamese primates. Uh, all three of the species are absolutely stunning, and um, we can combine uh, all three of them into one tour as well. Um, unfortunately, um, our group tour doesn't go to where these guys are seen, so um, this is really is only possible from a tailor-made aspect. Uh, however, the Red Shank Duke, which is probably the most popular, uh, is also the most reliably seen. So we do go to an area on, on the Sontra Peninsula where they are seen uh, quite, quite regularly. And then, and then also we've got the, uh, we can combine it with the Grey Shank Duke. Uh, these guys are a lot more elusive and, and a little bit uh, less known. Um, and, and as you'll see, they, they don't have that red trouser, they don't have that red shank, um, which, which means they can be distinguished because they do uh, live in quite fairly close proximity. I, I don't think they overlap, 
but they do live fairly close proximity together. Uh, again, this is this is sort of more in the central central Anamites, the, the center of the country. And then further south, we've got the um, absolutely gorgeous Black Shank Duke. And um, I do apologize for the quality of this photo, but I just wanted to show you the beautiful contrasting colors uh, that you get from, from the Black Shank Duke between it and, and the background. They are really stand out. Um, they are unfortunately very skittish, which makes them very difficult to photograph, but they are quite regularly seen. Um, and we have a very, very good record uh, seeing these guys in the south of the country. In a similar area to the, to the Black Shank Duke, um, got a good chance for the uh, first of the six species of gibbon in Vietnam. Uh, this is the southern buff cheek gibbon um, or yellow cheek gibbon, um, given its name from the male uh, with the yellow cheeks. Again, this is that these guys are sexually dimorphic. So the females are golden and the, and the males are black with golden cheeks. Um, these guys are also monogamous, like many gibbon species. So they mate for life. And um, in the mornings and, and, and late afternoons, they, they'll, um, They'll do, uh, they'll do sort of calls to each other. And um, it's a beautiful sound. And I, I wanna play you some of it now, if I can. Hopefully you can hear this, okay? Yeah, so this is in the forest of Katien in the south of the country. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just really nice to have this as a sort of a, a natural alarm clock, really. Um, another one of the given species, uh, another two of the given species are the, the white cheek gibbon, the, the northern and southern white cheek gibbons. Um, the northern white cheek gibbon is actually the, the rarer of the two, but the southern white cheek gibbon is, is, um, can be seen with a little bit of luck in the, south, in the central, uh, central Anamites again, in the center of the country. Um, and then to, to sort of round off the list, we've got a few macaque species. So we've got the rhesus macaque, which is the most common in the north of the country. We've got the long-tailed or crab-eating macaque, which is the most common in the south of the country. And then we've got the northern pig-tailed macaque and also the stump-tailed macaque, which are both sort of patchily distributed throughout the length of the country. Um, there are also two slow loris species here, uh, the Bengal slow loris, which is the rarer of the two species and the pygmy slow loris, which is actually uh, a lot more restricted in terms of range, uh, but it's a lot easier to see. Um, I say easy, it's still, it still is difficult to see, but it is definitely possible. Um, so we can head out at night and, and try for that as well. So yeah, I think um, for now, I just want to say thanks for listening. And of course, if you've got any questions, um, please do put them in the chat or, or and um, we'll, we'll try and get around to those at the end. Um, but for now, I think we will have a break, I believe. Um, so yeah, we'll be, we'll be back at 8.25 PM. Uh, what's the time now? Let's just check. That's about right. Is that about right, Georgie? Am I right in thinking 8.25 still, still on? Yep. 8.25 sounds good. So we'll see you all then. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, George, and welcome back, everybody. Um, so I'll just introduce Paul Stanbury now, who will be speaking to you about Costa Rica. Over to you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you very much, Georgie. Right, just excuse me one moment while I share my screen. Nearly there. Okay, right. <clears throat> well, yes, uh, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. As George said, I'm, I'm Paul Stanbury, um, and um, I'm going to now chat through um, one of my favourite uh, destinations um, on the planet, which is, which is Costa Rica. Um, as George said, I've been there on a, on a few occasions, um, and always absolutely blown away by, by the wildlife, wonderful landscapes, um, it's just, yeah, an amazing place uh, to visit. So where is Costa Rica? I'm sure most people know where Costa Rica is, but it's um, on the narrow isthmus of land that connects North America and, um, and South America. That's pretty much at the, almost at the narrowest point, narrowest down in, um, in Panama, it's just north of Panama. We, um, on both our group tours and our tailor-made tours to Costa Rica, we um, use British Airways flights and they offer a, a direct service into San Jose from, from London Gatwick. Um, and um, so Costa Rica may be, may be a pretty small uh, country, but it is incredibly diverse. So there's over 950 species of bird are crammed into this tiny little place. Um, that's more than Canada and the US combined. Um, it's a tiny country, covers only about 0.1% of the, of the world's land mass, but holds over 5% of its biodiversity. So it gives you some idea what an incredibly rich country um, Costa Rica is. So these are the, these are the main, some of the key uh, wildlife areas um, in, in Costa Rica. We've got San Jose, the capital, right in the centre of the country. Um, and then we've got, there's a string of very nice reserves down the uh, down the Pacific slope, down the Pacific side, um, Carrara um, National Park, Talamanca Mountains, which are inland, Piedras Blancas National Park, Corcovado. Um, and on the Caribbean slope, we've got Guero, Sarapiqui, and La Selva. It's just a very, very rich area to, um, to explore. But I've only put a few of the, the key wildlife spots on the map here. There's also Cana Negro, Manuel Antonio National Park, Palo Verde Wetlands. Um, there's, there's plenty to keep you entertained in Costa Rica if you're there for, for 10 days or if you're there for three weeks to, to a month. Um, but one of the great things about our tailor-made trips is you can tailor the tour to, to suit the, the length of time that you have available. Um, and you can, you can spend as long as you want in Costa Rica and not, not get bored. So the wildlife changes with altitude here. Down in the center of the, um, of, of the country, it goes through and south down to San Jose, and below you've got the Talamanca Mountains. Um, and the way the wildlife changes with altitude, so you've got the sea from sea level up to 11,000 plus feet at the Sierra de, de la Mueta Highlands. Um, and the wildlife also changes from coast to coast. You have a different suite of birds and animals on the, on the, the Pacific side of Costa Rica, to the Caribbean side. So if you're gonna do a tour to the country, then make sure you take in both coasts and go to a range of different altitudes as well. If you wanna get the most out of your, your time and see the most, um, the, the greatest diversity of, of wildlife. It is a very popular country though. So we would always recommend booking in the far in advance as you can for Costa Rica, though we're always happy to do um, a late minute, last minute tailor-made trip to Costa Rica, but it's, it's very popular um, and um, it can be difficult, can be challenging to get some of the some of the lodges last minute. But if you've got, if you, if you want to put plan, hopefully about a, a year or so um, ahead, then we can normally put together what's, whatever sort of itinerary um, that, you're, that you're interested in. And we can do trips, tailor-made trips to Costa Rica, um, fully guided if you want, so if you want your own a wildlife guide to, to drive you around the country from site to site. We can arrange that with no, with no, no difficulty. 
we have some fantastic guides in Costa Rica to, uh, to, to call upon, probably some of the best wildlife guides um, anywhere in the world. Other options are if you it's becoming an increasingly popular self-drive destination, so we can rent a vehicle for you, provide you with the uh, um, with, with maps and sat navs to get from place to place. And then you can take advantage of the guides at the different lodges. Alternatively, we can arrange for you to be transferred by a driver, again, from lodge to lodge, reserve to reserve. And then you, rather than having your own private guide, use the, um, the, the, the guides that are available at the lodges. Um, and it very much depends on, on your budget, your interests, um, and you know, various other factors. Um, most of our, well, all of our tours start with a with a night in San Jose, and there's some really nice little hotels in in San Jose. The one we try and book our groups into um, is the Bougainvillea um, Hotel, and the main reason why we use this place is it kind of has a massive garden, um, and so it doesn't take long for all you arrive. You go and wander around the garden, and you'll start to see some of the um, exciting birds and, and butterflies and insects and you get start to get an idea about just how wonderfully diverse uh, Costa Rica is. So most tours will start with a night in San Jose because the flights tend to get in mid-afternoon um, and then we head out into the wilds after that. So very much I'm just going to show you now a few of the, the, the key wildlife reserves, key wildlife hotspots in Costa Rica. But on a Taylor Bay tour you can pick and choose the particular ones you want to go to um, and also, of course, the amount of time you spent in each. But one spot we would definitely recommend you don't miss are the Talamanca Mountains and to the south of, of San Jose um, along the um, Pan American Highway. Climb up to over 11,000 feet, as I mentioned earlier, at the Cerro de la Muerte um, Highlands. But it's not long before if you did climb up into the hills, you start to enter the wonderfully moist um, um, lichen and moss draped cloud forests. Um, that is certainly one of my favourite habitats in the, in the whole of the, the country. Um, and nice temperature as well. It's a, place, it's a nice place to start your trip to acclimatise yourself to, um, to the tropics. Uh, it's not pleasantly warm during the day. It can be chilly actually at night in the morning, but you don't have the heat and humidity here that you get um, lower down. The, the lodge we tend to use, both for our groups and our tailor-made clients, is Savegre Mountain Lodge. It's a very nice, um, comfortable lodge. sits at around seven thousand feet um, up in the up in the mountains. They, the rooms are are, are very well appointed. Um, they're all en suite. Um, it's not a large lodge. Again, surrounded by um, very lush gardens, hummingbird feeders, bird tables. The great thing about most of the lodges we use in Costa Rica is that they are sat within um, within the wildlife and don't doesn't take long. After you've left your room, then you start to see um, the, the, the birds and, and the other natural history that we're after seeing. But one of our main reasons, probably the main reason for going up into the Talamanca Mountains is to see this spectacular bird, um, the, the resplendent Quetzal, um, often touted as um, the most beautiful bird in the world. And it's, it's, it's easy to see why. They live up in these um, high uh, cloud forests and the key, I should mention, the key time to go to Costa Rica um, for the for its bird life is Jan January, February, March, April time. It's a good time to get away from the British winter as well, get some nice Costa Rican, warm Costa Rican sunshine. But there are other times you can visit Costa Rica too. You can go in the autumn, and you can go even go in, um, in in the summertime if you wish. But the key area for the, the key time for the birds and also for the weather is that is our, our winter period. So as well as hopefully seeing uh, the Quetzals, uh, the mountains here um, are very rich in, in hummingbirds. So Vegre Mountain Lodge, and also there, there are a couple of little lodges we visit higher up in the mountains at about 9,000 feet, where we go in particular looking for the Quetzals. And they have lines of hummingbird feeders up here, which are just buzzing with the most wonderfully different colored um, hummingbirds. Uh, these are fiery throated hummingbirds. Maybe may be wondering why they're called fiery throated hummingbirds because they're not particularly fiery throated in this particular shot. But if you get them in the right light, then you can see why they got their, their name. Um, these birds have wonderful iridescence where they have to be pointing just in the, just in the right direction to the sunlight so you can see them in their, 
in their full uh, full brilliance. There's a wide variety of different hummingbirds to be seen up here down in um, Sebeg Grey Mountain Lodge. The feeders down here attract a lot of uh, Talamanca hummingbirds um, and some of the smaller varieties as well, uh, volcano hummingbird, scintillant hummingbird um, and others. The grounds are very, are very rich. There's a lot of fruiting um, bushes and trees in the grounds of the lodge. So you get to see a lovely variety of birds say, without even really going that far from your, from your front door. Um, um, this is a um, long-tailed silky flycatcher, uh, a real spectacular species. But you're also looking for um, uh, moving um, mobile flocks of, of tanagers, and warblers, and a wide variety of other species as well. Um, and we definitely recommend at least two nights, preferably three nights, um, up in the up in Savegre to really enjoy the best of the of the high altitude species. Moving down to the lowlands, um, move down to Carrara National Park on the on the Pacific's um, uh, coastline. This is a, um, a, 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 a national park of, of lowland rainforest. The place to stay here is Villa Lapis. There's not actually very many places to stay around Carrara, give easy access to the reserve. Um, Villa Lapis is a little bit, little bit rusty around the edges, shall we say, although they are apparently having a, a revamp in the next uh, year or two. But they are, it's in a fantastic location right on the, the edge of the national park with easy access to the reserves, to the reserve. Um, wildlife here, bird life here again, and spectacular, uh, wonderful long-tailed mannequin, uh, just one of, of numerous varieties of birds that occur in these, these lowland rainforests. Um, we'd encourage you to get up at first light. That's the time when the bird life is at its most active. As one of the mallequins and the variety of, of Toucans and toucanets, etc. There are there's the spectacular boat build heron that's regularly seen along the along the Tacolas River, um, and uh, a key bird for for most people is the spectacular um, a scarlet macaw. And there's a population of scarlet macaws that live in uh, Carrara National Park. And um, one of the must do things is to stand on the bridge over the Tacolas River. Um, in the evening, you can watch these spectacular birds um, flying into roost. There's also the opportunity to take a boat trip out into the mangroves to see some of the water birds that live here. There's roseate spoonbills um, here, but there are also a wide variety of other, other species to look out for. Lots of waders, terns, gulls, um, warblers that live in the, in the mangrove forest. Uh, it's often... Um, People often comment that it's one of the, the, the one of the highlights of their entire trip to Costa Rica is the boat trip out into the out into the mangroves of the Tacolas estuary. And as well as the bird life, there's some wonderful insect life to enjoy as well. The spectacular blue morpho butterfly is the largest of a wide variety of butterfly species that um, you're likely to see in the reserve, along with a few mammals um, as well. Mantled howler monkey is a um, definite um, um, possibility here. And the guides will also take you out at night to do a bit of spotlighting, um, to look for some of the nocturnal birds and, and animals of the forest. This is a spectacled owl. Um, in from um, um, Carrara National Park, we would recommend that you we can do a, 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 a clockwise circuit around northern Costa Rica, um, heading up to... Um, um, Aranal Volcano National Park. Um, this is a nice stepping stone from the east to the, um, sorry, from the west to the to the east coast. Um, volcano was active up until about ten years or so ago, and you could go around the the, the 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 back of the volcano and see red hot lumps of lava just bouncing down the um, the, the, the side. But it's it's actually gone dormant now. Um, but it's a fantastic place, not only scenically. Um, but for wildlife as well. You're at a mid elevation here, so different birds again to the ones you've seen in Carrara and up in um, Savegre. There's a lovely lodge called Aranel Observatory Lodge, which has a wonderful view out over the mountain. Um, and um, they have bird feeders in the, in the grounds as well, which uh, they put fruit out on every morning, attracting a, again a wonderful kaleidoscope of different colored um, shapes and sizes of species. The red leg honey creeper. It has to be one of the most spectacular uh, of, of, of all birds in, in, in Costa Rica, but it's just one of many. The, um, the, well, the silver-throated um, um, tanager here, one of a wide variety of 
different tanager species you're likely to see. Variety of hummingbirds. We, this is a, a, one of the larger species, the violet saber wing, um, known locally to the, as, um, to the guides as violent saber wings. Their very aggressive nature towards other hummingbirds, and they will drive away other uh, other hummingbirds that um, that dare to try and sip um, nectar from their feeder. And then, of course, there are some mammals here as well. Mammal watching in Costa Rica is not easy because um, there are. It's a very heavily forested country, and a lot of the mammals will occur uh, up in the canopy, and a lot of them will um, also come out at night. Um, but there are some really lovely ones to see. The three-toed sloth here, you can see um, on that, on his hind limb, the, the, the three toes, um, is, a, is, is a commonly seen mammal. And the guides tend to know where, where they hang out. They like cecropia trees in particular, so your guides will know where to go to find a three-toed sloth. And you might also see it's, it's um, close cousin, the um, Hoffman's two-toed sloth um, as, as well. And after, recommend at least a couple of nights in um, an Arenal, and then we move over to the Caribbean slope of, of, of Costa Rica. Um, and um, our favoured base here is Selva Verde Lodge, which is close to the, uh, on the Sarapiki uh, River, and gives easy access to, um, to the La Selva uh, biological center. So say Selva Verde Lodge, very nice, again, comfortable lodge, um, all en suite, really nice rooms. That's the, that's the common thing, common thing in Costa Rica. Are the, are the, the lodges are just so, so nice, um, nicely appointed, very comfortable and all in good areas for wildlife. And Selva Verde Lodge has its own private um, primary rainforest reserve, which you access over this bridge, over the um, Sarapiki River. They lots of birds like to, to enjoy as well. Um, this is a, a keel-billed toucan. It's a common species um, throughout uh, uh, Costa Rica. Hopefully, we'll see the you'll see the spectacular sun bitten, um, so called because as it's with, uh, it has the pattern of the setting sun on the primary feathers of its uh, outstretched wings. Um, and these birds are seen. Um, around the quite close to the bridge in um, Selva Verde, um, and they're relatively um, widespread across the wetlands of Costa Rica and down into further down into Central America. We will also spend a day at the La Selva Biological Center, so it's, it's, it's only worth spending at least a day there. Um, and uh, this protects a large area of, of primary untouched rainforest. Um, it's run by the by OTS, the Organization for Tropical Studies, um, and there, there, there are permanently based scientists which carry out research on, on the wildlife, and it's an educational facility, and they're also carrying out studies on um, sustainable forestry as well, sustainable tropical forestry. Um, but it's just a fabulous area for bird life. There are trails that crisscross out into the, into the reserve, um, you hopefully, we'll see this spectacular bird, which is a great curacao. Um, this is a female. The, uh, the males are black um, all over. These are turkey-sized birds, so they are spectacular creatures. Um, the very rare military macaw, um, if, if you're lucky, is uh, seen quite regularly here. And there's some other species. We've got the, the little um, uh, black and green poison dart frog. And you have strawberry poison dart frog as well, which we also seen commonly. Um, from Silva Verde, you can head up into uh, Tortuguero National Park, which is a forested park on the edge, right on the edge of the, of the Caribbean Sea. Um, time to go here, probably. You go here at any time of year, always lots of wildlife to see. But if you go in September time, um, August, September, October, then you should see, hopefully, you'll see the green turtles uh, coming up on the beach to, um, to lay their eggs. And maybe the, the little hatchlings um, scurrying down to the, uh, to the sea um, um, after making their way up um, through the sand. If you also, if you go September, October time and head a little bit further south along the Caribbean slope um, down to um, Puerto Limon and down towards the Panama border, then you'll hopefully get to see the spectacular migration of raptors and the, the birds of prey moving from North and Central America down into South America are funneled by um, the topography and the fact that the land, that the, the isthmus of land is getting narrower and narrower here. And you get 
heckles of thousands and thousands of raptors circling over the mountains here as they head their way south into Panama. So September, October is the time to go for that. Um, the southern Costa Rica has its own um, um, wildlife and spectacular landscapes uh, to enjoy. Corcovado National Park probably being the most famous of the reserves down in the south and, and your time down there will be centered around Corcovado but there are also other areas to explore as well. Piedras Blancas National Park, La Cruz Biological Center and others. You're right down near the border uh, with, with Panama here and again the wildlife and bird life is different to what you would see further north. If you don't want to drive all the way down there, it's not a, it's not a horrendously long drive, it takes five, six hours to drive down, but there are uh, internal flights um, that fly from San Jose down to, down to Cofito to, um, to cut the journey down, or you can also fly into Drake's Bay in, in Corcovado itself. So Corcovado, as I mentioned, is the, is the key place here. Um, it uh, covers over 424 square kilometers of the Osa Peninsula, and protects the largest track of primary rainforest left on Costa Rica's Pacific coastline. But the, um, the National Geographic named the reserve the most biologically intense place on Earth. Um, there are over 500 species of tree here, 6,000 species of insect, 140 um, species of mammal, and over nearly 400 species of birds. You get some idea about just how incredibly diverse um, Corcovado is. Deep in land, there are still jaguars that roam these mountains, and there may, although there may even still be harpy eagle around. So, um, but when when you visit the reserve, these the inland parts of Corcovado is pretty much inaccessible to most people. We're exploring the coastline um, and enjoying the wildlife of the of the coastal forests. We like to stay at Drake Bay Wilderness Resort. There are several varieties, different places to stay here, but Drake Bay is one of the, the nicest. You can see spectacular location right on a rocky headland, backed by this most um, amazing forest. From here, we actually take a boat to get to it. It's in, inaccessible by land. So you have to take a boat trip of a couple of hours down a river and along the coastline to reach um, the resort. And then you explore Corcovado by taking boat trips along the coastline, landing at particular um, wildlife stations and then hiking and walking from there. Scarlet macaws are, are common down here, They're a, a very common bird down in, in Corcovado. There's a huge variety of other species to look for as well. It's a particularly good area for mammals. So for those people with particular keen interest in mammals, Corcovado is, uh, is really probably the, the place to go. We've got white face capuchin monkeys, uh, the the northern tamandua, a, a small and very attractive little anteater, primarily arboreal, lives up in the trees, but sometimes seen at lower altitudes as well. We've got Baird's tapir, which are seen on a, on a regular basis, pretty much the only place in Costa Rica where Baird's tapir is, is seen well. If you go in September time, so if you've um, explored the, maybe you've gone to Totoguero to look for the, um, the turtles and headed down to look for the raptor migration a bit further south, you can cross over to the Osa Peninsula. And this is the time to see the humpback whales that come into the, into the, into the bay here um, at that time of year. So, so Corcovado is the key spot really to, to explore. Two, three or four nights at Corcovado will give you, um, will allow you to enjoy the highlights of the reserve, but there are other areas to see as well. Esquinas Rainforest Lodge is, is on the edge of Piedras Blancas National Park. Accommodation is a little bit more basic, um, but it does give access to a, a wonderful uh, network of trails in uh, this lowland, really very rich tropical lowland habitat. If you don't want to have your own private guide, and this is the case with a lot of lodges in Costa Rica, a lot of them will have their own trails that radiate out from the lodge that you can explore independently, um, or you can explore with one of the guides um, actually based at the lodge itself. Um, Esquinas so has, has a wonderful variety of different habitats from rainforest to riverine habitats or agricultural um, land and gives you a, a, a really quite a large variety of different birds to look for. Rufus Tail Jacama, um, I, I saw Rufus Tail Jacama myself in the grounds of the lodge um, when, when I stayed there. Um, we had, went out for a walk one, one morning and, and I think it was only in maybe an hour and a half we'd seen um, over 70 species of birds so incredibly diverse place but you can also go out at night as well spotlighting 
for anybody interested in herps, in um, reptiles and amphibians, this is the time to go out and with a spotlight. You can get to see a nice variety of, of, of different, um, different nocturnal species. And um, this is an eyelash pit viper. Um, and the, the, the most famous um, inhabitant of Costa Rica, the one that you see on all the, all the posters for the country, is the, the attractive red-eyed tree frog. La Cruche Biological Reserve is, is another very nice place to visit. It's about it's a mid, ele mid elevation. Um, it's um, in the in, in the botanical gardens, but surrounded by uh, about 300 hectares of pre-montane wet forest, home to over 300 species, 350 species of bird. So it's another biological centre, also run by by OTS, um, with with um, where they study climate, wildlife, ecology. Um, etc. But they also have a few rooms which they um, let out for tourists. Um, and they, there are bird tables here where they put fruit out um, each morning. Um, so you get really lovely views of, of the tanagers that live in these uh, live in this, this elevation. Um, golden hooded tanager here is one of the most spectacular. The beautiful speckled tanager. Um, blue crown mot mot also comes down for the fruit. And then you, so you can explore the, um, the grounds of the Wilson uh, Botanical Gardens, which La Cruche is set in, or the surrounding um, forests as well. And there's some other lovely birds to enjoy. Um, Golden-winged warbler, um, this is a, a migrant from, from North America, one of the most spectacular um, of, of the species um, you're likely to see there. Um, and a few mammals as well, Central American agouti scurry around um, out, um, around the grounds. And the, 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 the gardens have um, a wonderful variety of different orchid species. So they, they, they grow a variety of orchids here. Um, and so for, the, for those with an interest in the plant life, as well as the birds and mammals, there's uh, plenty to, to enjoy. So I think, yes, so it's just gone uh, 10 to eight, 10 to nine, sorry. So I will leave, uh, leave you there with a, a sunset um, over a hummingbird um, and just to say it's, it's the most, most incredible country to visit. I would thoroughly recommend um, a trip to Costa Rica. And if you have any questions, then please um, ask myself or Georgie. Thank you. And I shall pass over to Rajan, unshare my screen and pass to Rajan. Thank you very much, Paul, for the lovely presentation. Good evening, all. My name is uh, Rajan, and I am the operations manager at Nature Trek. I moved from India to UK in 2001 when I started working for Nature Trek. I look after India, Sri Lanka, Burma, and Bhutan at the head office. And uh, today I'm talking from Southampton in Hampshire. It's a bit rainy here but let me take you to the sunny tropical Sri Lanka. So to give you some perspective where Sri Lanka is, it is uh, in the Indian Ocean, southeast of India, the size of Sri Lanka is a tiny island. So the size is almost four times smaller than the size of UK. The population of Sri Lanka is 21 million people and 71% of the population follow Buddhism. So in Sri Lanka, we see a lot of Buddha statues, a lot of monasteries, a lot of culture, but with that, we see very rich wildlife as well. So today, I'm going to talk about our tailor-made tour called Wildlife and Culture. And as the name suggests, it covers all the highlights of wildlife and culture of the island. So we fly on direct Sri Lankan airlines straight on to Colombo. We do offer options of regional airports as well. Sri Lankan airlines flies from Heathrow, but we can use any airline, be it Emirates, Gulf Air, Qatar, from any regional airport is possible. The, the reason for using Sri Lankan Airlines is, as obviously, it flies direct. And secondly, the timings are very good. It leaves in the evening. We arrive next in the afternoon in Colombo, and we travel on to a next destination, which is Anuradhapura. On our 
four hours journey to Anuradhapura. We will make sure to have some stops to do some birding and also to enjoy the local fruits, as you can see here, the coconut water. Anuradhapura is a sacred ancient capital of Sri Lanka, and it is also a World Heritage Site. The reason of going to Sri Lanka is very much to see the culture, the architecture. As you can see in this slide, there are some lovely carvings. The right side, the top slide here, the tree which you see is a fig tree, and it was planted 2200 years ago. The root of this tree was brought from India, from a place called Sarnath, where Lord Buddha got his enlightenment. From Anuradhapura, we also have the opportunity of going to Polanavor, which is another um, cultural site. It is also World UNESCO site as well. The monument which you see here, they were built in 12th century. And most people go to see the stone temple, the, the, the standing and the reclining Buddha. The reclining Buddha is almost 14 meters in in, in tall. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we offer different accommodation options. With TaylorMade, the choice will be very much yours. Whereas we have in our set simple itineraries, we use accommodations starting from small family run to boutique to hotels which a bit of a luxury like this one in Anurad Anuradhapura. So we spent around two nights in Anuradhapura before we move on to our next destination. So we'll give culture a bit of a break and we will move on to Sigria. So look at the endemic species. So we'll be looking for Sri Lanka grey hornbill, Sri Lanka wood shrike, Sri Lanka jungle fowl. And in Sigria, we also have the opportunity of doing night game drive. And if you like the sound of it, we can do serval. On our group tours, we do only a one. But if with TaylorMade, the option is, the choice will be totally yours. And we can do many night game drives. We'll be looking for mainly nocturnal mammals, like the fishing cat, rent slender loris, gray slender loris. As you can see, these beautiful, lovely big eyes, they don't like the bright lights. So when we do our night game drive, we'll make sure we don't take any uh, very sharp lights. We don't use flash photography. Uh, the the grace and the loris are around six to 10 inches in height, and they have two breeding seasons a year. And they normally have one or two offsprings. They're normally found in Southern part of India and in Sri Lanka. We'll be also looking for common palm civet, giant squirrel, flying squirrel, jungle cat. And when in Sigria, we can't miss this lovely monument. It is It was built 1500 years ago, and the name comes from its shape. So it is called Sigria Lion Rock Fortress. And to go up top of this fortress, we have to climb 1,200 steps. So it's a bit of a challenge, but on our way, we look for fresco paintings, we look for mirror hall, we look for king's throne. The views from the top are just beautiful, as you can see in this picture. So it's worth going up to the top, but if you are not feeling adventurous enough, you can just stay on the grounds of the rock fortress and do some birding and enjoy the lovely views. In Sigria, we use a lovely accommodation called Hotel Sigria. It offers comfortable accommodation, but it also offers very good views of the rock fortress. Moving on, we go to Candy, but before we go to Candy, we will stop in Dambula and see these prehistoric caves. The fresco paintings and the statues which you see here, they were done around 150 years ago. But it's just lovely just to be there for a couple of hours, meet the local people, see these lovely caves, and then move on to the, the sacred city of Sri Lanka, Candy. It is sacred because of the Temple of Tut, which is here on the right, it has tooth relic of Lord Buddha. 
And every day in the evening or in the daytime, you will see locals coming, offering flowers, chanting. So it's such a peaceful place to go and enjoy. We also visit botanical gardens in, in Kandy. They're really well maintained with lovely orchids, different endemic trees, good bird life as well. And in the evening, we enjoy the cultural performances of Sri Lanka. So the folk dances of Sri Lanka. On this uh, tour, we also offer a train journey. So Sri Lanka, may, most of the travel is done on road. There are not many internal flights or uh, train routes. But on this sector, we use a very scenic train journey from Kandy to a place called Ella and then on to Nuralia. It is a very scenic train journey. When we arrive in Nuralia, you will feel that you are in Little England. It has uh, Victorian architecture, old post office, uh, uh, cabin near late Gregory, Late Queen, uh, our late Queen has visited this lovely place a few times. So it has that charm. And this is the only place where you will need warm clothing. It's a very tropical. So most of the clothing which you will require is very much comfortable. T-shirts, shorts will be fine. Whereas here you will need a fleece and trousers as it is in the mountains. Again, in Nuralia, we'll be visiting tea gardens to see how the tree is grown. If we get the opportunity and if you're interested, we'll take you to a tea factory as well to see how the tea is processed. Uh, maybe to try a Sri Lankan cup as well. From Nuralia, we'll go on to Houghton Plains, which is only 45 minutes away, to look at the endemic species of this place. And there is a lovely walk as well. There's eight kilometers walk, but if you don't want to do a walk, we'll just focus on the birding and look for Sri Lanka whistling thrush, yellow-eyed bulbul, Sri Lanka white eye, and the critically endangered purple-faced leaf monkey. Very elusive, very difficult to see, but our guides have found them on some of our trips. So this journey, will be the longest one. From Nuralia to Tissamaharama on to Yala is going to be a long journey of around seven to eight hours. But to make it comfortable, we'll stop at different places, including a spice garden. We'll see how the Sri Lankan spices are grown. We'll taste them. We'll have lunch there. And then we will move on to Yala National Park, which is one of the famous national parks of uh, Sri Lanka. Yala is famous mainly for the Sri Lankan leopards. They are bigger than African leopards. There are around 50 leopards in an area of 400 square miles. The so chances of seeing one are very, very high. They're normally seen near the water holes, on the tracks, sitting on the trees. So the chances are very high that you will see one. But I'm not saying that they are found everywhere. You still have to work hard to see them. So when we see them, they are just amazing. We'll also be looking for sloth bear. There are around 1,000 sloth bears in Sri Lanka. And these are the jeeps which we use for our jeep safaris, for our game drives. And as you can see, they're very comfortable, have window seats. You can use them for good photography as well. In Yala, we stay at Cinnamon Wild Lodge, which is a very comfortable lodge, offer ensuite facilities, air conditioned rooms. And from the ground of this lodge, we have been lucky to see good wildlife because it is only five minutes drive away from the national park. We will go to our next destination, which is considered to be the best place in the world to see wild elephants. There are 700 wild elephants in Udawalawe National Park. And the, the, you enter the park and you hopefully see one or see many. The accommodation is very good. In Udawale National Park, they have they have a elephant transit home, which is doing an amazing job. They take injured 
and the elephants which need help. They bring them here, they feed them, they look after them, and then they release them again in the wild. So the tourists are allowed to go uh, and sit in a platform, which is at a distance, but we can see and we can observe how they are looked after. So our next and the last destination in on this tour is Siniraja, which is a world UNESCO World Heritage Site. In Sri Lanka, there are 34 endemic bird species, and out of 34, 25 are found in this rainforest. 60% of the trees are endemic to this region, 50% of endemic of mammals and butterflies are found here. It is just an amazing place to visit. If you're interested in birds and the endemic species of Sri Lanka, this is the place to go. Most of the birding is done on foot. We will look for flock of birds. We'll look for the star bird, the Sri Lanka blue magpie. The flight of this bird is not very good. So it is normally found in this region. We'll look for San Francisco owl, founded recently by Deepal, our two leader, in 2001. We'll be also looking for changeable hawk eagle. And that's where the tour ends. We'll drive back to Colombo and, and fly home. But as it is going to be tailor-made, we will be looking, you can add to see blue whales in Marissa. The season starts from November, goes on till April. So we can do uh, trips to see blue whales, spin dolphins. We also offer, because we normally on the tour, we keep you very busy. And if you want to relax, in this lovely island, we offer a beach extension as well. So options are unlimited. You can choose what you want to do and we can cater that for you. On our group tours, we don't go to Jaffna up north in Sri Lanka. We don't go to Trincomalee, which is in, in, in north um, uh, of, of uh, northeast of Sri Lanka. But we can cater that for you on tailor-made trips. I will move on to India. Oh, sorry. First, let me tempt you with the slide of of the cuisine of Sri Lanka. My favorite is coconut roti, but we can cater to all needs, be it uh, gluten-free, any, any dietary requirements can be catered to in Sri Lanka and in India as well. So moving on to India, I will be focusing mainly on the tiger country. I come from Srinagar in Kashmir, which is here. I moved uh, to Delhi in 1990 and then uh, traveled whole of India. So I've traveled all over India and seen a lot. So I can arrange tailor holidays wherever you would like to go to. India initially had only five national parks, but very soon the government realized that wildlife is very important to protect. So after 1970, when the tiger, Project Tiger was declared, they started so many national parks. And now we have 166 national parks, 514 wildlife centuries, 70% of the tiger population of the world is found in India. In last few years, the tiger population has gone up in numbers. It's, it has hunt healthy population. Now we're touching almost 3000 tigers in the wild in India. 1200 species of birds, 61 are endemic to India. You must have heard about Indian visas in the news, how difficult it, it, they were to get, but now all is over, all is past. Now the electronic visas are, are back on and you just have to apply for Indian visas from your home. Online application is done. After you've applied within three to four working days, you will get your your visa by email. So no need to send your passports or anything. And the second important thing to remember when you are thinking of traveling to India are the park permits, which are very difficult to get. Some park permits in central India sell out at least four to five months in advance, sometimes six months in advance. So booking early is a key. And the reason is very good because they don't want too many tourists to go inside the park to disturb the tiger habitat, to disturb the wildlife. And if we are going to a national park, which is not overcrowded, you really enjoy the wildlife as well. So booking is the earliest key and the limited permits, which we can get for you. But obviously, we can always try. Even if it is last minute booking, we can always try. So let me take you to a very beautiful and popular national park called Tardova National Park, which is in central India. 
as you can see in the in in, the, in on the map we started sending tourists to tardova in 2008 i think well, we were the first few companies to start sending tourists to tardova but very soon we saw the tiger sightings were very good many companies are doing it as well but tiger sightings are amazing nature trek have 100% tiger sighting record in tardova it has beautiful lakes inside it has dense forest of teak and bamboo it is also famous for sloth bear gaur wild dogs and many other but tigers are the key so the chance of seeing tigers in this national park are very good let me give you some details of how we do the game safaris the jeep safaris in most of the national parks in central india so the the early morning the the wake up call is given at around 5 in the morning which is very early i'm afraid and by around quarter to 6 after having uh, hot tea and coffee we will start on these open jeeps with our packed breakfast and we'll start the game drive at around 8ish we'll have a breakfast as you can see laid nicely on on the on the jeep and we'll come back to our lodge by around half past 10 11 so the morning game drives tend to be longer than the afternoon game drives so we'll spend some time in the in the lodge after a morning game drive we'll enjoy the swimming pool the comfortable rooms we'll enjoy our lunch and then by around half past 2 3 o'clock we'll go back uh, to the national park and enjoy the afternoon game drive and come back when it is sunset so we'll moving on we will uh, go on to the second most popular national park of central india which is pench national park which is inspiration for kipling's jungle book and you may have seen a documentary by bbc spy in the jungle so that was shot in this national park it is only a couple of hours drive from a big city called nagpur so very tour- very popular with tourists and local tourists as well it is mainly teak forest tiger sightings are not that good but very good for wild dogs amazing uh, hunters uh, they hunt in packs and the chance of seeing them are very high in pench Kana National Park is my favorite national park in whole of India. I just love Kana. Um it is evergreen sal forest. It's a huge big park, have two entry point, offer 200 species of birds, 22 species of mammals, have swamp deer and your chance of seeing tigers are very very good. These are swamp deers. Tiger sightings are just lovely. When you when you see tigers there you will just enjoy. Blue bull and we stay mainly in kana jungle lodge and this is a family who looks after this lodge dimple looks after the 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 food part of it lovely lovely food and you will see women touching uh, touches in in this lodge which are very interesting to see jay in the middle their son he's an expert in butterflies and stars so he will he takes our clients for butterfly walks he's if he's around and uh, tarun uh, he looks after the wildlife and the game drive aspect lovely lodge people love it simple but lovely jungle lodge the population of india 70% stays in villages the life of villages is very simple and the the villages are mainly employed in agriculture so if you are keen on your tailor made holiday we can take you to a village show you the village life as well bandavgarh is the smallest national park have has the highest density of tigers it is mix of um, uh, sal and bamboo forest have a lot of open marshland so very good for tigers so another nice lovely park to see tigers it is where the legendary pair sita and charger were there and now the tigers which we see directly or indirectly they are rated to sita and charger so what one of the very good national parks to visit to see tigers on our tailor made trips we include train journeys to see real india the platforms are buzzing uh, people are offering teas the, the 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 fellow travelers will come to you say hello they will want to speak to you so it's a lovely way to travel and see the real part of india so tigers part is finished in central india but if you want to see one horned rhinos we can take you to kaziranga we can take you to cobert national park to see wild elephants we can take you to uh jorat to gibbon century to see hillock gibbons we can take you to gujarat to see hyenas um uh, asiatic lions 
uh, Red Panda, of course, uh, we can do it in West Bengal. So there's so many things which we can see in India, like the snow leopard up in Ladakh, um, in Himas National Park in Ule, uh, birding skimmers in, in, in Chambals. But when you go to India, how can you miss Taj Mahal, all the culture of it? So we can include Taj Mahal, we can in include Palace of Winds in Jaipur, uh, the Jaswan Thara, the Mahargan Fort in Jodhpur, um, the Kutub Minar in Delhi, the beautiful village in Orcha. India is really colorful. It, it is a colorful country and the spices and the food is amazing. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I will hand over back to Georgie and open the floor for questions. Uh, we can't hear you, Georgie. No, <laughs> you've gone. Maybe Paul can. I could do the questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hang on a moment. Technology is not my strong point. Um, right. OK, so while Georgie tries to fix her microphone, I will just start with the questions and answers. So the first um, the first question is for Rajan. Is where in Sri Lanka has the rebel activity been happening and um, what's been the activity recently, especially relative to where you would go? So I think you can basically say, you know, is, is, it, yep. is it now safe to travel in, in Sri Lanka? Uh, Sri Lanka is very safe to travel. We have already sent tours to Sri Lanka starting from October onwards. Initially, there were no rebels, there were no fighting going on. It was basically problems with the infrastructure. There were no fuel, there was no money left in the country, but the neighboring countries helped Sri Lanka and now it is back in the tourist map. And I think this is the right time to go to Sri Lanka. It is very safe. You can travel anywhere in Sri Lanka, starting from Jaffna up north to Yara National Park down south, south or to Trimkumali or to Marissa. So wherever you'd like, it's all safe. And Foreign Office is very happy for us to send tourists to Sri Lanka. Our group, which had just recently come back, had an amazing time. And the Sri Lankan government really is desperate for tourists. They have made provisions for tourism. So there is no shortage of fuel, no shortage of cooking gas, all the hotels are operational and the best part is there are less tourists. This not overcrowded as it used to be before. So it's the right time to go. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you. Um, right, the next question seems to be for me, Costa Rica. Um, how far would we be walking in any of the day in the daytime, distance and, and elevation on the group tours? Um, one, none of our group and they tailor-made trips to Costa Rica are, are difficult at all. Um, the highest altitude you get to is the Cerro de la Muerte Highlands, and that's only very briefly. That's about 11,000 feet, and that's only if the weather's clear enough and you, take, you, you drive up there just for just for a morning um, to have a look for pig-billed finch, I think, and a couple of the other um, species that occur up at high altitude. That, that aside, you're walking on forest trails, so you need to be... You need to be all nimble enough to be able to walk on a forest trail. You're stepping over roots, going up and down little slopes, um, but it's all taken at, at a leisurely pace. Um, so it's then they're, they're, they're not difficult tours at all. Of course, when you're up in the mountains, the trails do go up and down. If it's been raining, it might be a little bit slippery in places, um, but they're 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 not. It, it's not difficult at all. If you remember the average age of a of a nature strip client is fifty to seventy ish. So we're not going to be um, running up and down mountains and doing marathons. So yeah, they're not they're not difficult. Um, and the next question is uh, is again for for Rajan actually. At the Taj um, at the Taj Mahal is one allowed inside 
uh, or can one wander endlessly or even make multiple passes through there? So having how long can you spend around the Taj Mahal and are you allowed actually inside the building? We allowed three hours in the actual place. So when we enter Taj Mahal, which offers beautiful gardens and two more monuments, which are on the left and right, the mosque and the other one, um, we can spend full three hours there if we, if we want to. But inside the mausoleum, the actual place where the, the graves are of uh, Mamtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan, that is close to tourist and it was closed around 10 years ago. You can still go inside and see the replica, which is on the top. You can see the inlay, beautiful white marble inlay work, but you can't go inside the down, with the, which is in the basement. So you're not allowed to go there. But yes, you can, if you want, you can go inside again to see the replica of um, the white marble, which is built there. And normally inside it's, it's, um, very busy and very crowded. So you have a round, you see the beautiful inlay work and the, the lovely carvings which are done there. And then you come out and enjoy the surroundings. Just behind Taj Mahal, there's a river flowing. So it is a very scenic place just to just sit down and enjoy and relax, enjoy the beautiful gardens and the guides which we provide. They are always happy to take you to each and every place of that complex not only inside, and they will spend a lot of time there. Uh, so no rush at all. As with Taylor Mint holidays, we have the luxury of spending more time at one place. So thank you. Thank you, Rajan. And next question is for George. So regarding primates, I know Nature Track are about to launch a group tour to, to Gabon, um, which we did in the latest newsletter. Um, would Gabon perhaps be possible as a tailor-made option in the future mandrels are very high on my list yeah um absolutely that's the plan anyway um we really hope that um it's obviously a pioneering group tour so um we we it, we, it, we're gonna see and hopefully it goes very well um and then uh, when it, when that group tour comes back um we'll certainly be raring to go if it's uh if it looks like a possibility to open up for tailor made I um, actually did speak to a gentleman on the phone today who was also very keen to do Gabon on a tailor-made basis. So, um, yeah, um, that, fingers crossed. And, and, yeah, it's definitely in the plan for, for, for the future, perhaps next year. Thank you. Right. Um, second. I think that covers, I think that covers all the questions. I, I just saw one question, Paul. So, let me, right. um, so I'm just regarding uh, the tigers and how safe it is to do jeep safaris inside the national park. Obviously, the jeeps are open. On all the national parks um, in central India, we use open jeeps. We don't use big trucks because the wildlife experience is not as good as going on smaller jeeps. Um, having said that, um, uh, it, it, it is... Um, Obviously, we're going in a national park and there are uh, tigers, there are leopards inside. So the rules are very strict from the forest department. We can't go very close to the tigers. So we have to keep a safe distance. But we have not really uh, in, in our history of sending trips to India from last nearly 30 plus years or maybe more. Um, we have never had any problems where we have uh, seen attacks on our clients uh, from open jeeps. We have kept a good distance and um, we have enjoyed the wildlife. We have obeyed all the forest department rules and our guides are very good with that. But yes, we have been lucky in close tiger sightings, keeping our distance and taking lovely pictures. So no problem at all. Our guides are very good. They will keep safe distance. They will look after you. So don't worry about um, any attacks. I saw another question for me, uh, Paul, uh, here, uh, which is uh, regarding the Nagarhole National Park and the Black Panther. Yes, we are still doing Black Panther, Rim of the Black Panther tour. So that is a group tour. We also do tailor-made. So if you want to visit Nagarhole on a tailor-made holiday, it can be organized. Blackie, the 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 
the, play, the Black Panther, which is the only one in Nagarhole, is back. So that's a good news. The sightings have uh, increased again for a period of nearly, I think, three to four months, Blackie disappeared. And only a couple of weeks ago has um, appeared again. And uh, we are just been lucky. Our trip have come back. They had a glimpse of uh, Blackie, Black Panther, but they were so lucky with wild elephants. They saw tigers on most of their game drives. They saw the other wildlife. They did a boat trip. So a lovely national park to go. And yes, the dates for 2024 are already out. They are on our website. We are doing trips. We have a trip going in April. Then we have a trip going uh, in November uh, this year as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rajan. <clears throat> so I guess, Georgie, are you still muted at the moment? <laughs> Yep, you are right. Okay, so I'll <laughs> I'll close down then and just say thank you every much. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us um, this evening. Um, this is actually the last of the um, Zoom our Zoom presentations um, for, for this winter. So we'd like to thank everybody who's joined tonight and previous ones as well. We hope to be start um, doing more uh, later on in the year. Um, along with some live presentations as well. We're going to start our roadshow up again um, later on um, in uh, 2023. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for, for Julie jo jo joining in, for tuning in, sorry, this evening and joining us. Um, and uh, if you have any questions on any of our tailor made trips, uh, Georgie and uh, George and Rajan and myself would be more than, more than happy to, um, um, to chat with you about them. And um, yeah, have a good evening, sleep well, and thank you again. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.